Don't starfish produce shells as well? Good question. The starfish do have, they have, um, so they're a different group of animals. They're the echinoderms related to, so it's starfish and sea urchins and that kind of thing. And they have got a hard outer coating. And um, yes, if you find it, they do dry out and you can kind of keep the shells too. Um, so yes, they do. There are other groups of animals that make shells, but they're different sorts of shells made in a different way. Um, and not quite as diverse as mollusks. There aren't as many species of starfish as there are as mollusks, which is why I chose mollusks. <laughs> Good question. OK, I think we've got one, one here. Yes, great, thank you. In the last slide, you showed the, the mollusk which had the stripes. Yes, the blue ray limpet. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that just attract attention to the predators? That's a great question. So, so do those blue lines attract predators? Um, we actually don't quite know why they have those blue lines, um, but we think one theory is that what they're trying to do is look like one of those sea slugs that I showed you. Not the actual same ones, but another species of brightly colored sea slug, which tend to be very bad tasting. So those slugs have lost their shells, so they're a bit vulnerable to being eaten, but they kind of replaced it by having really nasty tasting compounds in their skin so that predators soon learn not to eat them they taste disgusting and they're kind of poisonous. So we think it's possible that the, the blue ray limpets are kind of impersonating a, a poisonous sea slug with those stripes, possibly. But we haven't tested that yet. So now then, should we have another one over here? Should we get one? Yes, down here. That'd be great. Yeah. And should we pass that mic? Um, let's go back a bit. Let's go back a few lines. Yeah. We've got some pass right at the top here as well. Oh, great. Do we have a mic up there? Great. OK, let's have this one here, and then we'll, we'll go up to the gallery, and then we'll have a question from, from over here. Yep, in the green top. OK, great. This one here. Go on. What's your question? Uh, uh, what inspired you to basically um, study the sea? <laughs> what inspired me to study the sea? That's such a good question. Um, I, I always loved being on the beach when I was a kid, and we would go on holidays to Cornwall a lot. Um, so I always loved being outside. I loved um, collecting shells. I loved rummaging through seaweed to see things. But I think really, if I'm completely honest, what made me completely addicted to the sea was when I learned to scuba dive, and I got to see sea creatures in their element and got to be beneath the waves. And it's an incredible experience. And if anyone is ever thinking about learning to dive or having a go at it, I would definitely recommend it. Snorkeling too, just being in the ocean and seeing sea creatures going about their lives is what really inspired me. And that's what I continue to do as much as possible in my life now. So thank you. Do we have a question from up the top there? What mul mollusk do you think is doing the best against the acidic water? That's a very good question. So which mollusk is doing the best in the face of acidification? Now, actually, I showed you a picture earlier on of uh, a cuttlefish. Um, and they're mollusks. They do have shells, but on the inside, it's kind of interesting. They put their shells on the inside and use them to help them sort of gain buoyancy and swim underwater. And strangely, we don't quite understand why, but they are doing quite well in the studies that show uh, of, of higher CO2 levels. And they actually seem to benefit from it. They grow faster. Um, it might be something about the fact that they're quite developed as organisms, that these cephalopods are very intelligent, they have very fast metabolisms, they grow quickly, and they seem to be doing okay. So, so cuttlefish could be all right. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see, but they do seem to, certainly in studies, they seem to be doing okay. Okay, green top here. Well, do any animals borrow sea urchin shells? Do they borrow sea urchin shells? That's a great question. Not that I know of. Um, I don't think there are any hermits that, that borrow sea urchins, um, but hermit crabs will basically try anything they can, especially the ones on land. If they can't find a shell, they'll use old bottles and cans and bits of rubbish. Um, so if they found an intact sea urchin, they might try, but they're quite fragile. Um, when I first started diving in the UK, I used to try and find, you get really big sea urchins around Britain down in the sea, and I would find dead ones and try and bring them back up. And Every time I did that, they would always be broken by the time I got them back on the dive boats. They're quite fragile. So I don't, think they, I don't think they'd make very good homes, unfortunately. That's a great question. Right, back over this side. Where's the mic? I've lost the mic. Here we go. Yes, we have that one here. Brilliant. And who's got... Have you got the mic back there? Do you want to, yes, chat there with the white top. And let's get another one from up in the gallery, too. I can't really see. The lights are really bright. OK, what's your question? Why haven't octopuses evolved to grow shells? Well... They kind of did the opposite. We think what happened was that 
millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, when that group, when the octopus first evolved, they actually evolved a life without shells. And they decided, they, didn't just, they, they evolved a life that didn't need a shell. Uh, and other things took over. So they used their brains and they used the colors in their skin to, to overcome that. So they haven't evolved shells because they don't need them. And they've gone down a different path in the evolutionary tree of life that says they're fine without their shells and they, they do okay without them. And there are things they can do that would be impossible with the shell. They can move more and they're faster and so on. But it just shows you that mollusks are very diverse and they can do different things with their bodies and with their shells. But um, it's a great question. Thank you. Right, how about over here? Yes. Um, so you were saying how they grow their own shells and how they drill into the other ones. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, why can't the ones that are the prey just create their own little novels to drill into the other ones? <laughs> it's, it does make your brain hurt a bit, doesn't it, when you think about all these different animals eating each other, chasing each other. I mean, it's just a case of the way that they will be feeding. And so presumably most of the, um, it's a lot of the bivalves that are the ones that are getting eaten. And the, the, they are down an evolutionary part of the mollusk tree that doesn't hunt for food, but filters their food from the water. Um, so they're filter feeders. So scallops, mussels, all those sorts of things will actually just filter water through their gills and take tiny particles of food from that. Um, so it's kind of a long jump for them to then become the hunters. Uh, and it, it could happen, it's possible, it just would take time. But as it is at the moment, they basically just sit tight, don't move, um, filter water that comes to them, and unfortunately become the you know, full prey of these, these snails that can roam around and catch them and drill holes in them. So how are we doing for time? Yeah, we've got time for a few more, I think. One up from up, up the top? Thank you. I just want to pass your mic back. How does the CO2 get into the water? So it just dissolves, basically. I mean, ultimately, it kind of, it'll get stirred up by waves and wind and so on. But if you have a gas in contact with a, uh, a liquid, um, what will happen is it will just dissolve into that liquid. That's just, um, it's like a gradient because there's actually less carbon dioxide in the sea than there is in the air. It moves down that gradient to kind of try and even things out a bit. Um, so it's just a dissolution thing, really. And then another big thing about the acidification of the oceans is how that water then sinks down to the bottom and all the kind of underwater currents that are taking the acidified water to different areas. So that's a big question too, as to how fast that will happen. Great. Now, where are our mics? Where's our next mic? Should we have a question? Uh, how about right the back row there? Should we have another one on this side? Who else would like to ask a question? We've got time for a few more, I think. About right up the back there? Okay. Fantastic. Someone got a mic. Yes, go ahead. Um, do you think that there are any mollusks that either need a shell that don't have one or don't need a shell that have one. Right. <laughs> We have to, I, I think when you think about the way that we, when we look at animals today and see how they live their lives, we have to understand that they've evolved a certain way of life because through, through natural selection, so it's what works, it was, it's what has happened through a process that's, that's not deliberate, it's not that they were aiming to have shells or not, it's just what's happened to have been beneficial to them at that particular time as they've evolved over thousands and millions of years. Um, it could be that th other things change around them and a shell no longer becomes a benefit to them. Perhaps it's too heavy. Um, one, for example, is the slugs that live on land. They don't have shells. And, and we think one reason for that is that they can't find enough calcium carbonate to make their shells because there's not much in their food. So over millions of years, over thousands, tens of thousands of years, probably millions of years, those slugs did stop making shells because it was too much energy for them. They couldn't find enough raw material. So they did, they did lose their shells. It just took a long time. So we see like, nothing is static in nature. Things change. Evolution is still happening. So you will see, I'm sure we will see mollusks making shells, losing their shells, if that's what benefits them in that particular situation. Thank you. That's a bit of a tricky answer, but I hope that was good. Let's have a question from up here. Yeah, let's have your question here. Where did the... Snails that make iron shells get the iron from. Where did the shells get the, sorry? Where did the, the iron snails? from? Where did they get the iron from? Yeah. That's a great question. Mm. It would have been in the water. So what those deeps, the snails that live down in the deep sea in those hydrothermal vents, where do they get the iron from? 
it would have come from the water. So it, or, there's lots of minerals and irons and metals that come up through the seabed and form these black smokers, these tall chimneys at the bottom of the sea. And in the water will be iron. So I think those snails will probably just absorb it um, through their bodies, maybe through their food, uh, through their mouths, and, um, and then they would make their cells from that. So that's a really good question. That's brilliant. I think we've got time for a couple more, unless anyone got wants to... another one up the top here. Let's have another one up the top. Yes, brilliant. Um... With the predator mollusks, what material would their spike be out of? The ones, the, the ones that suck the blood and that yes. drill holes. Good question. Um, they will be, they make, a lot of them make their weapons out of their teeth. Um, so a feature of mollusks that I haven't mentioned so far is their tongue. Most mollusks, most sea snails, um, bivalves don't have them, but snails have a tongue called a radula, which is like a kind of piece of sandpaper, basically. Um, and recently we discovered that limpets have the strongest, t uh, their teeth are the strongest known biological material. They're much stronger than spider silk. And they spend their lives scraping um, seaweed and tiny bits of kind of green slime off rocks. And their teeth are incredibly strong, otherwise they'd shatter. Um, and their teeth are, I think they're made of partly calcium carbonate and partly um, some chitin and protein. It's a bit of a composite, but mainly calcium carbonate, the same as their shells. Um, so they'll use the same material. They'll adapt a tooth for that. Um, those blood-sucking snails use their radula, I think, to, to, to cut their... Um, and I think the drilling snails as well, I think that's their teeth. Um, another lovely predatory um, snail uh, are the ones that shuck oysters. They have a prong sticking out of their shells, and they use them to jimmy open, so just to open up oysters. And that you would, if, like in a restaurant, if you had an oyster and you have a knife to kind of open the shells up. There are snails that have a similar thing sticking out of their shells to do that. So they have evolved lots of different ways to predate on each other, actually. Um, kind of fascinating, yeah. Let's have another question from this side. How about um, the girl there in the white top? Yeah, this one here with the blonde hair? Yeah. Should we pass this one? We care to, care to do a few more? Hey, how about this one down here? Do you want another question from up there in a second as well? Great. Okay, go ahead. So, you know the starfish? Um, the death starfish? With the the crown of thorn starfish? Yeah. yeah? Um, how would they sense, where do they sense the chemicals oh, in the water from? That's a very from good question. So how do the crown of thorn starfish sense the chemicals in the water? <gasps> Suddenly I feel like I'm not enough of a starfish expert to tell you. I think, um, I think what the starfish do is I think they draw water into, they will have a kind of sensory pores in their body which they pull water into and they will have um, sensory cells. I, th I think they kind of inhale the water and sniff it that way. I'm not exactly sure, I must admit. Um, so you've caught me out but it's a very good question. They'll have something similar to those, the, the ears of the sea slugs, but I think it's inside their bodies, which they have a way of, of sniffing the, the smells of the water. And they'll respond to those particular um, molecules that are coming off of, um, off of the triton. So whatever it is, it's a, it's a smell of a triton, if you like. Um, should, we have, should we come back up to the top? How Wonderful. come squids give out a bluish ink colour, but no other animals kind of do? That's a great question. So squid have ink. Um, so do some of the other cephalopods too. Um, there are, uh, actually some of the other mollusks have sort of funny ink things going on too. There are some sea slugs that produce um, clouds of pink colour. Um, and it, so it's an ability that mollusks have to create these kind of inky, inky secretions. Um, squid do it mostly to, to startle their prey, uh, startle hunters and so they can escape. So it's sort of like puffing a, smoke, uh, a, a face full of smoke at someone and then running off if they're attacking you. Um, so it's just, it's a particular ability that mollusks have evolved and it, it, you can find it all around the mollusk group. Um, the sea slugs do it, we think. Um, there are chemicals in the, this pink stuff that they produce that um, that kind of puts the predators off eating. It kind of stops them from wanting to feed. They've done experiments where they've had a crab in a tank and one of these sea slugs, and if it creates this puff of pink stuff, the crabs basically just stop looking like they want to eat because crabs kind of like go, om nom 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 nom, when they're, when they're kind of hungry and they move their mouth parts like, I'm going to eat you. And then you put this stuff on them and they stop doing that and they're just like, oh, that doesn't taste good. I guess it just tastes bad to them and it puts them off their food so they're less likely to eat the sea slugs. It's kind of clever, really. So. Yeah, have a question here. Um, why, why does, why does sea shell, why do they, why do predators like drill into seashells? 
That's a great question. Why did predators drill into them? Well, when we're talking about the ones that come in two halves, so like the bivalves, like this scallop, so if this was still connected, you would sort of see it all closed up. Now, I don't suppose you've ever eaten... Have you eaten an oyster? Have you ever eaten an oyster? No. Okay. Um, if you did, or if you had one at home, you would find that to get into it, it's really difficult. And the oysters, you need like a knife, a shucking knife, to kind of we to open the shells up to get to the food inside. So these bivalves are really well protected from predators. They're really hard to open up. They're completely encased. The problem with the snails is that they've got an open hole. So they're quite easy. We saw how easy it was for the, 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 the snake to get inside a shell. They've got like an open hole. And some snails do have a trap door, which they will shut down behind them, called an operculum. And that makes it harder. But they're still quite easy to get into. But these bivalves are really hard. So you can't open them up. So the alternative is to basically just drill a hole in them so you can get into them. It's the way of getting into the food um, that's inside, the, the animal that lives inside. So that's how, again, it's evolved because that's it was the way that predators kind of through natural selection they worked out a way of eating the animal inside and drilling a hole works so that's what they do cool now should we have should we have one more one more question okay oh dear okay there's a really tall hand out going here can we get a mic to this <laughs> with a tie here thank you thank you so much for all asking your questions and being so eager this is fantastic we could go on all night okay how long do you think it'll take to find all the species and what will the majority look like <sighs> Like, will they have shells or...? That's brilliant. I'm so glad I asked you. That's such a great question. How long till we find all the species and um, what will they look like? I don't know what they'll look like. I think that slide I showed before with all those crazy colours and funny things of those tiny micro snails we found, I think that shows us that the mollusks are full of surprises and I just... I think we're going to still find some incredible things that no one would ever have imagined going on with the shells and without shells and all those things. How long it will take? Very good question. At the rate we're going at the moment, it's going to take a very long time. Uh, especially, as I said, we just don't have the experts. These, a lot of these mollusks have been collected, they've been taken to museums, and they just sit on a shelf, and they haven't been identified because we don't have the experts to do it. So as it is, it's going to take us probably hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, we may never get there. Um, but maybe we'll see improvements in technologies. We're already using things like DNA barcoding, taking bits of tissue and using that as a way of identifying species. So it could speed up, but I think ultimately it's going to take people to want to do it. And we're going to need new scientists getting into the field who want to go and find things, identify them, and ultimately to understand more about these wonderful, diverse, extraordinary creatures. So hopefully it won't take hundreds of years, but that's great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you for your questions. Thanks.